Well, welcome. Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for joining us today. Uh, I hope you can hear me. Uh, my name is Raymond Karam. I'm the Senior Director for uh, Programs and Outreach here at the Arab Gulf States Institute. Uh, and on behalf of us and uh, Sakal Avenue, I want to welcome you to the second edition of uh, the Arts, Gulf Arts and Culture Symposium uh, that we are co-hosting with Sakal this year. Uh, and want, want to welcome colleagues who made it from Dubai here, Fiza Akram right here, and uh, Roxana, who is in the back right there. Um, so um, most of you know us as a, a traditional um, a Washington DC think tank that focuses on uh, policy, uh, economics, uh, um, uh, for the foreign policy of uh, US foreign policy towards the region. Uh, but uh, we thought that we'd, you know, there's no way you can tell this, this Gulf story or a Gulf moment without really focusing on uh, the arts and culture uh, in the Gulf. Uh, so uh, starting about two years ago, we did a small event. Some of you may have come to it, uh, um, a spoken word poetry. Uh, but then last year, we decided to uh, scale it up and, and invite uh, more artists, uh, more uh, people working in, uh, uh, in the art community, the culture community throughout the Gulf uh, and have this conversation here with them uh, in, in the US uh, and provide that new perspective uh, so, so policymakers uh, in DC can take that into account when they are uh, formulating uh, policies coming out uh, of Washington. Uh, so this is the second year that we're doing this and as I mentioned, we've partnered with SRKL Avenue. Um, uh, the partnership uh, will continue throughout the year uh, and we look forward to being uh, in, in Dubai in the fall uh, for the second, um, uh, the second installment of this partnership. Uh, today, um, we start this conversation with a panel discussion. Uh, we have folks coming from Bahrain, from the UAE, um, from New York, not too far away, but the conversation will be moderated <laughs> by my colleague, Yasser Shishtawi, who will introduce the panel. Uh, if you didn't receive an invitation for tomorrow's event, so tomorrow is kind of our uh, showcase event, uh, with performances from artists from the region and a reception at the Phillips Collection, so we hope that all of you uh, can join us then as well. Uh, so with that, I give it to Yasser, please. All right. Uh, thank you, Raymond, for the introduction. And again, thank you all for coming to this panel, um, which is the first panel of the uh, uh, Art in the Gulf City Symposium. Um, the panel today is titled Big Spaces, Small Spaces, Urban, Architectural, and Artistic Strategies uh, for City-Based Cultural Districts. Um, and the reason we have uh, sort of proposed this, this topic uh, and specifically today's panel is that Gulf cities over the last few years have been very active in developing uh, art uh, and cultural initiatives. Uh, and this has been primarily at the level of spectacular and uh, monumental architecture and museums. Um, and there are many examples for that. Uh, the Louvre Abu Dhabi, which was just uh, opened uh, very recently, uh, the Qatar National Museum, which will open uh, in 2019, I think. Uh, both of them designed by Jean Nouvel and are quite uh, spectacular in terms of their architecture. There's also the King Abdul Aziz Center for World Culture in Dahran, uh, designed by the uh, Norwegian firm Snoeta. Um, and many, many other uh, uh, buildings. The Kuwait National Cultural District uh, uh, also co is coming on board. So these are uh, quite... Uh, uh, visible, big, monumental, spectacular spaces. Um, so that seems to attract the attention of the media and a lot of people when they think about culture and art in, in the Gulf. But at the same time that there is um, a sort of underground movement, uh, artistic movement that is happening throughout the region in the Arabian Peninsula, in Saudi Arabia, Kuwait, Bahrain, and the UAE, um, which has not received perhaps as much attention as it should. And uh, this movement has found, uh, 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 or, or they have found places for expressing their, their sort of artistic uh, creativity in industrial districts, in, in uh, marginal sites, and abandoned areas in uh, Gulf cities. And um, today's panel is, is very much uh, uh, about this. And we, we have conceptualized this, these, big, these museums as big spaces and these marginal sites as small spaces. Um, and the Gulf, of course, is not unique in that. There are uh, this, this movement towards uh, 
smaller cultural spaces using industrial districts and marginal sites as inspiration for cultural districts or as hubs for cultural districts is something that um, is taking place worldwide throughout many uh, uh, cities uh, in the world has been going on uh, for quite a while. And this, of course, raises a whole set of, uh, I think, very interesting issues related to gentrification, uh, uh, issues in terms of policy, urban planning, social aspects, uh, etc. So this is very much the focus of today's panel, where we will be looking at uh, urban architectural strategies uh, within uh, cultural uh, districts. So that's sort of in a nutshell what uh, uh, we will be talking about in today's panel. And uh, to that end, we have assembled a really uh, fascinating uh, group of experts uh, who come uh, to this from varying disciplinary backgrounds as policymakers, government officials, cultural managers, architects, sometimes all of these things at once. Uh, so, uh, and uh, I just want to very briefly introduce uh, our speakers. Um, so our first speaker is Metha El Mazroy, uh, who is uh, editor at uh, Watat Magazine, which is a publication uh, that aims at providing a platform for discussion among architects and designers. Uh, she also co-founded the Center for Architectural Discourse, uh, which is a very interesting uh, 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 sort of hub for research in, in, on the region. Uh, Metha has a bachelor degree in design management from the American University in Sharjah. Uh, and is currently pursuing, or perhaps has been pursuing, I think you're almost done, you submitted your dissertation, I think really like yesterday. Uh, <laughs> wow. uh, she's at Columbia University at the Graduate School of Architecture and Planning Preservation, where she uh, will be uh, uh, getting a degree in curatorial and conceptual practice in architecture. So thank you, Mitha, for thank being you. here. Um, our second panelist is Noura Sayah, who is Head of Architectural Affairs at the Bahrain Authority for Culture and Antiquities, uh, where she is responsible for planning and implementing cultural institutions, managing exhibitions, and uh, academic exchange uh, initiative, initiatives. And Noura is an architect by training. Uh, she worked in many cities throughout the world, and she was also appointed as co-curator at Bahrain's first exhibition at the Venice Architecture Biennale in 2010. And that particular exhibition was awarded the Golden Lion, uh, something that we have been trying to, you know, <laughs> replicate and imitate since, but nobody <laughs> really <laughs> has, has been, uh, been able to do that. But it's <laughs> it's a wonderful uh, exhibition, and uh, hopefully somebody from the Arab world will will continue that tradition. Um, and she also oversaw the Bahrain Pavilion at the Expo Milan in uh, 2015 as Deputy General Commissioner, which I think won an award as well, right? I mean, it, yeah. it was quite... Uh, so thank you, Noura, for being here. And uh, our uh, uh, third presenter, Adrian Ellis, who is the co-founder and director of the Global Cultural District Network, um, which is an international collaborative uh, network aiming at developing and connecting cultural districts throughout the world. Um, uh, Adrian uh, has been consulting and uh, on cultural initiatives, and he worked with cultural uh, organizations throughout the world, and was also an executive director of jazz at the Lincoln Center in New York City. Uh, he has a BA and MA from University College in Oxford, uh, and completed graduate studies at uh, London School of Economics. Uh, our fourth presenter, Vilma Yurkuti, couldn't make it, but we have uh, a very uh, 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 we have a replacement, uh, uh, Fiza, from uh, uh, the Cercal Avenue, who is a cultural development director. She will introduce a video that we will be showing. <laughs> Where's Fiza? Yeah. Uh, so she will be introducing the video, but uh, and then perhaps if you have any questions about Cercal Avenue, she'll be happy uh, to answer. Um, so um, what we will be doing today is I have asked the panelists to prepare uh, a brief, about five to eight minute uh, presentation to talk about their work and how it relates to the themes of the uh, symposium and to this panel in particular. Um, so each one will, will make that presentation and uh, then uh, we will have a discussion among us. I have a couple of questions, certain some issues that I would like to uh, talk about and see the uh, speaker's response to that. Um, so that will take maybe 30 minutes, and uh, then we will open up 
the f uh, to, to discussion among uh, the participants, so that perhaps about 20 minutes. We'll see how the timing goes. I mean, that can be uh, flexible. So I guess that's all I have to say. So um, perhaps we can start with our first presenter, Mirna. Uh, thank you, Yasser, for the introduction and for inviting me to speak today. I'm happy to be amongst all of you. Um, and in response to the theme of the talk today, I would like to propose a question. How can a small magazine even begin or assume to build a space for cultural discourse or an architectural one, not that the two need to be separated? And if a small magazine can assume such a presence, where does it sit within an evolving cultural landscape? Um, the small magazine that I can personally use as a site to begin to unpack the question is Wetad, a biannual that frames itself as an architecture and design publication and one that happened to emerge from the UAE. It is currently at its eighth edition with the aspiration to carry on with many more. Uh, editorially, we claim that the space, uh, we claim the space of slow publishing and one that we're conscious of and like to remain within. Um, I'd like to think that it's a position as a mag uh, that its position as a magazine and not a book allows space for uncooked ideas to manifest. If anything, the pages provide the space for experimentation and small thoughts, and ultimately, I hope to provoke through a piece of writing or image, where not every uh, and where not every argument has um, has to claim a neat conclusion. But through the various editions of the print, some conversations can circulate, ones that begin to shed light on the various textures of the region, or alternatively, new ways of thinking about the built environment. And this weight is not only carried by the editorial team of the magazine, but it's exemplified through the voices of the writers and contributors, um, a generation of artists, architects, aspiring poets, and thinkers that have a place to publish about their own territory and region. Um, it is also a pleasure to believe that it could be a little space where our audience can come across new things. Um, I'd like to, and to exemplify that, I'd like to read a, an excerpt from one of, uh, on one of these moments, a vignette that I hope illustrates the voice of a writer that claims her space in the city by writing about the city and responding to its existing social structure. It's written by Leanne al Ghassain and it's titled, A Bird in a Tree, A Tree in a Bird, Symbolic Passages in Rapid Nature. Um, it's a guided tour of a uh, neighborhood of Basta in Lebanon, and here she takes you through it. Um, I was in the middle, uh, I walk in the middle of summer, in the middle of Ramadan, in the middle of Beirut, in the middle of Basta, in the middle of the street. There is no way forward with so much baggage, but I push on. We are weighted by our emotions, by our past, by our bundles of self-consciousness, and by the efforts of all the connections we make. Um, I wear short shorts in the middle of one of Beirut's most conservative neighborhoods, Khandaq al-Ghami, uh, also known as Bastafo al Tahta, the upper and lower parts of the neighborhood, marked by mosques like bookends on a shelf. Our brain synapses are, uh, are a night sky of twinkling stars. When you see someone in real life you've only seen on the internet, the link that you finally make between the face, the name, and the present bursts with an almost violent light. When you notice that the butcher's shop shares a wall with a political party, headquarters in your mind's eye, um, a shooting star, how, how is the way we take walking tour of the city indicative of the flow of thoughts in our minds? Are the people of Basta the slaughtered or the butchers? Do easy definitions and straightforward identities exist anymore? First, what is a tour? The guided tour follows a plodding plot, uh, turning the, the exclusion of disembodied outsider, often known as the tourist, into a linear corporal narrative. All the ways in which the historical layers have impacted a place are dug up by the tour guide. All the different modes of sublimation are concentrated and hence resublimated, pointing at ideas turned into buildings, people into monuments, and words into names. Where is the guided tour? Where is also, uh, there is also a narrative mapped into sensory perception. Meeting, uh, sight, and sound crashing into matter, into ripe green grocers, into stop signs, and uh, salty school children and men riding scooters, all curving into constellations um, to be further div divined. 
I would like to take you on a tour of the Basta neighborhood in Beirut, but without being a tour guide. I'd rather guide you to guide yourself, to overthrow or divert anyone who speaks like they have authority, to think about how they tour for a single, um, for a single place, could be the tour of, uh, could be the tour for anywhere. Um, I don't know if I can claim that Wetad is a place where culture emerges from, but what's important to us is that the print doesn't come off as a space that frames culture as a consistent social moment, uh, or that moments we publish and choose to foreground represent a total view. And I also don't mean to end this talk on a semi-morbid note, but I would like to share a quote from an article that Itel Adnan published in Bedoun titled Little Magazines that I think could be applied as a way to read small cultural spaces as well. They rarely last. Uh, it is almost part of their nature. They are not meant to last. They are meant to follow one person's impulse to gather bits and pieces, works by poet writers and artists, which may become literature much later. In this way, small magazines are full of hope. We don't know how long they will live, and they often disappear, but better to disappear than become a bad magazine. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> uh, thank you, Mitha. Um, Nora? Yeah. Okay. Uh, thanks a lot. Thanks, Yasser and the Institute for the invitation. Um, as Yasser mentioned, uh, I work in Bahrain, at the Bahrain Authority for Culture and Antiquities, uh, where I oversee the architecture department. And I thought to share with you today not an exhaustive overview of what we do, but a quick overview of four projects that I thought could open um, interesting channels of discussion and debate over the theme uh, presented today. So the first project I wanted to talk about was a temporary installation that we did in 2012 on the topic uh, of public space. So. In 2012, Manama, the capital of uh, Bahrain, was uh, chosen as the capital of Arab culture. And there was uh, an agenda to have um, a series of events over the year and that each month would discuss a specific topic. And the month of February was supposed to be a celebration of architecture. Um, and probably as most of you are aware, uh, to February 2012 was a year after the events of February 2011, which was um, you know, quite a dramatic ch um, change on the social, political, and cultural landscape in Bahrain, and we thought it was really important to be able to talk and address this in a certain way. Um, and so the idea came quite soon that we would launch an international competition, an ideas competition, that would think of rethinking one of the central public spaces in Bahrain and to open a broader question and discussion on what public space in the Arab world today should be, what should it look like, who should it serve, and to, to launch a, a debate on this. And in parallel to this, the idea was that we would build a pavilion that you see here over the public space in question that would trigger, uh, along with the competition, some ideas on what the potential of public space could be, um, and to open up somehow also uh, the desire for public space um, and also somehow to neutralize again the term public space because following the political events, unfortunately, the term public space in itself became a very loaded term. It became unfortunately only associated with um, you know, uprisings and demonstration. And for us, it was really important that we would reclaim this term once again and that it would become once more you know, something that you could use in the city with positive connotations, with, you know, connotations of bringing people together, of discussing things, you know, of neutralizing it one again, once again. So this pavilion was installed over one of the main um, roundabouts and thoroughways of Bahrain. We had an agreement with, um, with the police authority that we would stop traffic from sunset to uh, sunrise every day. So to re-pedestrianize the area, um, and to invite people to use it in different ways. As you see from the image, all the, all the results of the competition were also displayed on the square, and there was a public voting to choose, um, apart from the, the, the competition entry that was selected by a jury that we had appointed, to select in parallel to that a kind of people's choice award of what you know, the people that frequented this square was. And the whole idea was it was to also you know, give a larger participation to the public in big urban planning projects, which normally doesn't happen. Um, and it was interesting to do this project because once you start intervening in public space, the moment you change 
uh, a few existing conditions, even if they're quite minimal, like here, I mean, there were no thresholds added. We just added a shaded roof. You realize that um, some portions of society change the way they use these spaces. So here, for example, you know, although the space was completely open, you can see that um, most of the people chose to stay outside the space and not enter it and not engage with it because the moment you formalize certain places, some people within society feel they do not belong in these places anymore. And it's really important to do these sort of um, interventions because then you also understand when you need to design such spaces, what it is that you need to be careful about and what it is that you need to take uh, into consideration. Um, and it's interesting to do these interventions temporarily because they give you a kind of, um, you know, things that are invisible within society and within the city become for a moment in time tangible and visible. And then you can understand how to work with these things. So these are some of the, um, the shots from the exhibition uh, projects that were exhibited and the interaction that people uh, had with them and the discussions that they had. You see behind them one of the ballot voting uh, boxes that were installed. We also, I think I removed that picture, but we had also designed the exhibition in such a way that it was on wheels. So when with the roundabout would open for circulation again, you could also um, look at the exhibition as a kind of drive-through. And it was a way of kind of engaging with the city in the way that it was rather than in the way we would like it to be maybe. But in, in all of this and all of the projects we do, we really try to engage with the audiences, um, you know, in any which way which we think that they would engage with, you know, in, in, a, in an effort to make culture more relevant to them, more accessible, um, and to make it maybe a bigger part of their daily lives. Um, and this is one of the events that we had on the opening night, which is, I always like showing this event because we, it makes us look like our events are really, really popular. There were maybe <laughs> 800 people at this talk. And I mean, it, it was an architectural talk. There was nothing really interesting being said. <laughs> but I think what's really interesting about this picture is I think that when you provide conditions in the city that cannot exist uh, otherwise, um, you create something s special and magical. And I don't know if you can see in the back, but I think also 80% of the audience did not speak English very well, so they probably also didn't understand what was being said. But there was something quite magical about uh, this moment and about the possibility for people from different segments of society to be present in a shared space that unfortunately in our cities we've lost today. And that sense of a shared space was so magical that people stayed standing for four hours or three hours and a half because they felt they were part of something um, that was temporary, that was momentary, that was a moment that they wanted to, to enjoy um, and that they wanted to be a part of. And I think that if you're able um, to create such instances in, in, in the city, uh, even if temporarily, you're able to achieve maybe something that we can aspire our cities to develop in a more permanent uh, nature. Then the, the second project I'm going to talk about is uh, a project that we've been working on since 2008. It's a project called uh, Pearling Testimony of an Island Economy. It's the second site in Bahrain to be inscribed on the UNESCO World Heritage List. Um, and, it, and it's located in the island of Muharraq, which was, until the 1940s, 50s, the center of the pearling industry uh, in the Gulf. And the idea with this project, apart from, um, you know, the nomination on the UNESCO World Heritage List and increasing the cultural tourism in Bahrain, uh, is mostly to serve as an urban regeneration, as an urban catalyst for the old city of Muharraq and the remnants of uh, the pearling heritage uh, and its urban context from the 1930s. What you see here um, is the overlap of the coastline and the island of Muharraq of the 1930s with what it looks like today. So you understand that through land reclamation and a lot of urban development, the relation to the sea has unfortunately been lost. But what you still find uh, within these alleyways of Muharraq is the structure of the urban fabric itself. So although a lot of the architectural heritage has been lost, we're really quite lucky that most of the urban footprint is still present there. Uh, unfortunately, it suffers from a lot of things that other you know, similar um, urban districts in the Arab world and beyond suffer from, so lack of maintenance, you know, urban degradation. But the, you know, the urban qualities themselves, the narrowness of the street, the profile, the plot sizes still remain. And it's something that we're working very hard um, 
to to regenerate to uh, you know to to make it once again a lively n neighborhood you know that serves everyone. So as part of the project, we have um, the rehabilitation of 17 historic structures that each relate to the pearling industry, whether it's the house of the captain, the house of the diver. And they're all really interesting, not because they're the most important or um, special <coughs> houses in Muharraq, but because they all tell part of the pearling industry. And through these houses, you can understand the way the society functioned at the time of the pearling era. As, as part of this project, and it's what I'm going to talk about uh, now more precisely, um, as part of the, um, um, let's say, of the wayfinding and the signage, we've also introduced 17 small public squares along this three kilometer and a half path. And these squares are really meant to act as point of encounters between the visitors to the path and the local residents so that the project itself doesn't only serve um, you know, the visitors and the people coming from the outside, but it also is used as a way to regenerate the city as a whole and to propose uh, spaces that are not found in these historic districts uh, anymore. Also, because historically, um, in Islamic and Arabic uh, cities, the city developed with mostly the green spaces being interiorized in courtyards, uh, and there was not a big tradition of public space as we understand it today. But we also understand that a city needs to evolve and that the needs of people also evolve. So these small public, let's say, pocket squares that we're, we're building are built on the, um, on the locations of houses that were demolished. Uh, and the idea was instead of rebuilding these houses in, uh, let's say, in mass or in building, we would rebuild them through the canopy of the trees that would re-outline the, the existing plot lines of the buildings, but would offer another type of space that's missing from the city. So you see here, these are uh, images from some of the two first squares that we first built uh, as a mock-up. So at the very start of the project, when we started it, we decided to build out of the 17 squares two squares as a test, where we would also understand the way in which the community would interact with these spaces. So we could also learn from it before we would build the, the, the 15 other ones that we needed to build. Um, and then uh, at the launch of, this, uh, of these two spaces, we uh, organized an event, which was called Private Conversation in Public Places, which was meant to discuss uh, these squares. So we invited around, I think, um, 15 architects over two days that were specialized in issues of public places where we discussed uh, the issues of the space and we discussed also the interaction with the community. It was open to everyone and this was also really nice because I think the, the title of the conversation was private. A lot of people were really interested to attend because they thought we were going to be discussing something kind of secretive or... And then I remember the first day the talks got a bit delayed and people started getting really mad because they thought they were going to miss out on something or they were like, but did it start? You said at five and it hasn't started yet. And, uh, <laughs> but it was a good way to kind of pe get people engaged um, in the spaces. Uh, and the third small project I'm talking about, I'm going to talk about is a small music house, which in Bahrain is called uh, Adar. So it's a... Uh, a traditional music house that you would find um, around Muharraq and Rifa' and other areas in Bahrain. The ones that were in Muharraq were specialized in a special kind of music and dance called Fajiri, which is what the people on board the boats, uh, the pearl diving boats, would uh, the, the folkloric dances and songs that they would sing, that then um, became somehow a bit more uh, institutionalized and you could find around small music houses in the city. And this was a really interesting project to work on because I don't know if you see the white house that you see at the forefront of the, of the picture was the original dar in Muharraq. And the idea was to offer uh, an extension to this dar because um, the, the music group that was there was lacking a few small services, but I mean a small thing. But while we started talking to them, we understood that the main problem was not really a problem of space or functionality, or it was really a problem uh, of visibility in the city, uh, and, and more an issue of, uh, of image somehow, that they felt that they wanted to be more present within the landscape of the city, that they wanted to have a space where when they hosted bigger musical performances, they could have a bigger audience and that they could have a bigger visibility uh, in the city, as I said. Um, and for us, this was interesting and also challenging at the same time, because for us, it's also really important that these spaces um, 
that the original spaces, first of all, are preserved, that they're, they're promoted, and that also, while we develop certain, um, let's say, musical or cultural activities within the city, we're, we're careful not to also uh, change them too much or evolve them too much that we, that we lose the, the original. Um, and these these musical performance norm normally happen in a in a kind of measureless setting. So a space that has quite a clear typology with you know a, pr a proportion of space, a certain way of sitting. And this space is is it's not something that can be expanded uh, ad infinitum somehow. It's something that has a certain proportion. So the the challenge here was to think how we could maintain this typology while still making it more visible in the city. Uh, and to adapt to a bigger audience. So we commissioned a Belgian firm called uh, Office Kirsten Gers David van Severen, uh, who spent a lot of time on, in Bahrain working on this project. And they developed uh, a typology for a space where actually we would maintain the proportions uh, of the original uh, Majlis and Dadar structure, which you can see here. But um, with a special facade where there, when there would be um, bigger performances in the city, we would be able to open completely the first layer of the facade and the second one, so that the whole space uh, of the performance space on the ground floor would completely open up into the city, and that the streets of the city itself would become the, the place for the audience to interact with the with the thing. So you see here, the setting of the singers themselves is conserved in terms of their proportion and their relationship to one another, but it completely opens up to the city and it becomes an open theater that engages um, with the local community, that engages with the street, that invites the street into the performance space, and in that sense makes culture once again a more visible part of the city and a part of the city that's also engaged in people's in people's daily lives and they feel a bit more connected to. And the last project that I'm gonna talk about really briefly was our participation at the Expo in Milan in 2015, which was under the theme of um, food for all, uh, now I can't remember, agriculture. It had food in it, yeah. It was about food. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Energy for life, yeah, that was the one, sorry, yeah. that's true. Uh, and where we decided to focus more precisely on agrarian heritage and the way in which agriculture is a big uh, contributor as well to national identity, which unfortunately today um, you don't feel so much in Bahrain because a lot of the agrarian heritage has been uh, lost. So the idea was to showcase uh, 10 gardens within the pavilion that would be... Uh, kind of a physical uh, exhibition where throughout the seasons, you know, the smells would change, different fruits would be in season. So to have a really kind of physical embodiment of the exhibition rather than a representation uh, of it. And uh, what was more interesting for us is that from the onset of uh, the building of the pavilion, we decided that we would move the pavilion back to Bahrain at the end of the, the sixth month of the exhibition. Um, and it was, it was a really interesting project to work on also because um, moving, we moved it into, uh, you see here, really the core of uh, Muharraq, so in the, in the center of uh, the historic parts of Muharraq, right next to the house of uh, Sheikh Isa bin Ali, which was the house of one of the formal rulers of Bahrain, so really in, in the heart of Muharraq. And it was really interesting to look at this shift between what you build as a representation of a country in an expo, which is probably one of the most uh, superficial environments you can, you can think of, and what happens when you build a building that is meant to serve that purpose and you move it back into you know, one of the most traditional urban cores of, uh, of Bahrain and how it adapts to that, you know, how notions of representation uh, of a country somewhere else uh, adapt when you bring them back to, to the very context they were meant to, to represent. And these are, the project is now open, but I don't have very good pictures, um, where you see the way in which the project uh, reintegrates to the urban condition uh, of Bahrain. Uh, and it serves as another one of these small cultural institutions within the heart of Muharraq. It's open now as a botanical garden. So it's a, it's a public garden that's uh, open to all. Um, and it's funny because when we first opened it, a lot of people from Muharraq, it's quite beautiful because it still has a really big pedestrian network, would come in and they kept on waiting for us to kind of program it. So they thought, okay, you know, maybe tomorrow they'll open the shops or they'll, and you know, they said, yeah, but what is this going to be? And we're like, you know, 
this is it, it's a botanical garden. <laughs> and they're like, but well, what are we supposed to do? And we're like, you know, you see the trees and they, they'll change and then there are some seasons there'll be fruits. And, but it's been really beautiful because a lot of people now come with their children and as the seasons go by, you know, they show them something that used to be part of people's everyday life that's unfortunately disappeared, but that gets reintroduced somehow, um, uh, you know, and as another part of their daily life and as, as a building that can be uh, used to, 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 to tell and count part of the, the national identity and heritage. Sorry if that was a bit long. That's all right. Uh, thank you, uh, Noura. Uh, uh, and our uh, third presenter, Adrian. Um, thank you. So um, uh, I want to talk about some of the more general issues that actually Noura's framed perfectly in the context of Bahrain. Um, Yasser, in his introductory comments, talked about um, a juxtaposition between improvisatory, um, small, uh, um, uh, somewhat ephemeral spaces uh, and larger, more formal ones, and the juxtaposition between, if you like, the sort of formal urban architecture and the ferment that, that um, organic cultural districts, sometimes known as bottom-up districts, have. And um, that's a fascinating contrast because I think most people planning larger districts want the DNA of those um, organic districts and can't quite figure out how to get that DNA into their projects. And so there is something very important there. Um, uh, and uh, what, what's interesting is that in many ways, um, both audiences and um, artists are moving more and more towards the improvisatory, towards uh, temporary structures, towards informality, at the very time that um, countries and, and cities and states are investing millions and millions of dollars in um, very formal spaces with, uh, with uh, a certain amount of inflexibility in them. So I wanted to explore some of that. Um, it's it's um, running interference, to use an American metaphor, between those two worlds that I've done a lot of my professional life. And about sort of four or five years ago, um, in a, uh, looking at and working with people who are working on these larger cultural districts, around the world, I thought it might be interesting to get them in a room with some of the people who run these smaller, uh, uh, or are responsible for these smaller spaces and these smaller, more organic ones and see what the dialogue was like. So um, I was lucky enough to be able to grab uh, uh, Michael Lynch from West Kowloon, which is one of the larger cultural districts, um, a sort of very top down, um, uh, and uh, uh, somebody from Museum Island in Berlin, and somebody from Brooklyn, um, uh, which is a very sort of organic district, and get them in a room sort of grafted onto the side of a conference in Sao Paulo and see what they talked about and uh, whether there was a common dialogue. And um, the fascinating thing was that there was immediately a dialogue. And uh, it was not about architecture. It was not about how do we put up big buildings or how do we get Frank Gehry in the room or anything like that. Um, uh, indeed, um, there, was a, there, was, there was a dialogue almost immediately around a cluster of subjects that that group now extended to about 50 organizations are still talking about. Um, and that's really what this global, rather pompously called Global Cultural Districts Network is, which is a context for them to talk to one another. And the sorts of things that um, they talk about are um, really many of the things that uh, Nora's talk exemplified. It is, first of all, how do they maintain the relationship between cultural production and cultural consumption when their districts become successful and property values um, begin to rise and production and consumption, the juxtaposition of which gives the heart and the soul to these, these districts, starts, start get pushing apart. And what do you do about that? A, a big policy issue and a fascinating one for which there are answers. Um, uh, a second one is how do you animate public spaces successfully and what are the dynamics of uh, animating those public spaces? <laughs> Um, the relationship between tourism and the local community and who are you that they're there to serve and how do you serve in an intelligent way both those communities. Um, what are the metrics of success? In other words, your stakeholders want you to be successful as a cultural district. What does that mean? How do you, how do you measure impact? Is it economic impact? Is it social impact? What is social impact? What is cultural impact? Governance, whose voices should be round the table when you are planning a district? Whose voices should be heard at the table when you are running a district? How do you ensure that their right voices have got the right volumes attached to them? Often you'll find some voices extremely loud or dominant in, uh, 
uh, often artists are not represented, often the local community is not represented. How do you ensure a system of governance? Um, and so that is really the agenda of this, 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 this gang. They convene once a year to discuss these issues. Um, we met most uh, recently um, 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 uh, about two weeks ago, three weeks ago, in Dubai, um, um, hosted by Al Sakal Avenue, about 150 people from about 50 districts, uh, uh, for two days discussing these issues in the context of the Gulf, and then um, a, a, uh, a fascinating tour to, uh, to sites in, um, in Sharjah and in Abu Dhabi and in Dubai to, um, uh, to explore some of these issues in, in, in practice. Um, uh, and um, uh, also the commissioning of research, research around such issues as, as, I, as I've mentioned, governance, um, uh, issues of branding and identity, uh, 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 commissioning research, but also, importantly, um, a, a larger, uh, I think, agenda, which is changing the climate of opinion. The climate of opinion of decision makers who believe that the hardware always trumps the software. That is to say that the, uh, that the physical um, architecture in, in, in the planning of cultural districts is somehow um, uh, superior in the hierarchy of decision making to all these sort of uh, uh, softer issues that in fact uh, deeply affect the, uh, the long-term success. So, um, uh, so the, uh, this sort of community or network who also now co-commission and do many things together that, you know, happily that, you know, I don't even know about because they're all talking to one another as, as networks are supposed to, um, uh, has attempted to sort of try and, um, uh, uh, as I say, run interference or, 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 or create a dialogue between exactly those two worlds that you identify. There are, there are, however, I think some interesting um, differences between the top down um, and bottom up that are worth, um, you know, reflecting on because they are they are highly um, uh, they are relevant. They don't create a gap in the room. On the contrary, but they are the origins um, uh, and dynamics are important. Bottom up cultural districts are really no different from other industrial structures, uh, clusters in many ways. There was a uh, 19th century economist, Alfred Marshall, who um, talked about industrial clusters. I don't know whether there's any sort of macroeconomists in the room, but um, the idea that, that there would be vertically and horizontally integrated clusters of jewelers or seamstresses or, um, uh, or um, uh, people making saddles, and what was it about them that would make them come together rather than spread apart in order to sort of grab a piece of the market? And it's about those synergies that you get and that pooling of knowledge you get that really um, forms the basis of successful organic districts. Um, uh, they are, however, um, fragile entities. Uh, they are. They end up where they are because of the economics of those locations. When the economics of those locations change, um, then uh, they tend to change uh, uh, and move too. Um, uh, my analogy, which we were talking about earlier, is they're like wild orchids. Um, uh, they grow in the most um, uh, abstruse and difficult to get at places because the soil is conducive. And if you pick up this orchid and stick it down you know, in Midtown and say, grow, that orchid is unlikely to grow because the soil, i.e. the, the, the uh, conditions that, um, or the, the soil and the moisture in the atmosphere, uh, is different. So, so there, is a, there is an essential character that when you are planning, as you are, and you are attempting to recreate, uh, then you have to, as, as, as Nora's work cl clearly emphasized, think very intelligently about what are the dynamics that you are trying to replicate. You're not replicating the superficial things. You're trying to replicate the fundamental conditions. Um, the drivers behind the larger cultural districts that we read about in, the, in, in newspapers are very, very different. And I believe that they are, you know, um, th there is a completely different set of drivers behind those. I think, you know, the most obvious driver is, is that, you know, um, shibboleth, if you like, uh, globalization. That is to say that, um, if what is globalization? It's people, uh, money, um, ideas, whizzing around the world faster and faster as um, barriers, um, whether those barriers are regulatory or whether they're technological, as those barriers come down. And as all those things whiz around the world faster and faster, um, cities become homogenized. That is to say, they start looking more and more alike. They have the same um, big box retail, they have the same um, uh, they have the same cars in them. They, th th their identity, what makes them distinctive, to be crass about it, what makes them brands rather than commodities, um, uh, uh, begins to get eroded. So people in those cities 
Those people are competing for inward investment, they're competing for knowledge workers, they're competing for high-end fancy tourists. They begin to think, how do we compete? How do we attract those things? And first of all, you know, th there's a certain hierarchy and culture is not at the top, public safety is at the top, and after that probably traffic is next, you know, um, and education. But pretty near the top is culture, that is to say the assertion of cultural identity. And there, in my humble opinion, there's a sort of collective failure of imagination because at that point we say, okay, um, how do we express culture? And one of the easier ways uh, is to do that through iconic and highly expressive architecture. And so there is a sort of, there's a sort of um, odd bind in that there is a certain homogeneity in what we choose in the, in, in the range of architecture, uh, or there has been over the last 20 or 30 years, it's a relatively small cadre. In fact, it's not a relatively small cadre, it's a tiny cadre of, um, uh, of um, uh, architectural choices that we have made in order to express that identity. But, but um, they are, uh, so, so part of what this GCDN thing is about is about thinking if you are going to think strategically about the expression of identity, then architecture is clearly part of it, but then all these other elements that go into organic, organic um, uh, and successful cultural communities uh, are also part of it. Um, and therefore, we need, as it were, to think about if we're going to grow orchids, if we're going to be orchid growers rather than... Uh, orchid hunters, then we need to think think about that soil. I think one you know one other interesting thing is you know, the, our our um, appetite for investment in um, in uh, cultural infrastructure has been pretty unabated for the last thirty years. In other words, if if we track the level of expenditure in um, in new cultural buildings, it is utterly remarkable. Um, uh, and uh, the interesting thing is, it's not really driven by demand. It isn't actually driven by people saying, we want more museums, we want more performing arts centers. It's on the supply side. It is, it is, it is you know, us, you know, thinking about how we, um, uh, how we create a, a, a set of conditions. If um, we are in a period when we appear to be, and we'll see what happens at 2 o'clock, but if we're in a period um, when... <laughs> Um, uh, some of the forces of, of globalization are in a degree of retreat or at least um, uh, a, a degree of uh, pressure and not just you know in the states all around the world um, uh, it will be interesting to see whether those same drivers are in play in other words if my rather crass theory about globalization is correct what changes will we see in both the level and the nature of uh, investment in cultural infrastructure over the next generation as the world changes I think it's I, I think it's fascinating um, uh, uh, and I, you know, I don't know whether it'll express itself in, in more nationally oriented architectural styles, whether it'll uh, ma manifest itself in, in um, buildings being built, as is, as is in the case in West Calhoun, in, fa in fairness, that are um, uh, uh, around uh, a broader range of art, for, um, uh, art forms than has historically been the case, which has basically been, um, you know, um, uh, 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 art galleries and and performance spaces that are designed primarily for Western classical music, or whether we begin to see uh, other changes. But I think that we're in for a very interesting period in terms of what gives character to, or, 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 or cultural expression in cultural infrastructure. So, um, so you know, I think, I think your uh, juxtaposition between small spaces and, and, and big spaces is also a juxtaposition between two worlds that badly, you know, need a dialogue and, uh, um, and you know, hopefully some of, some of this sort of discussion provides a context for that dialogue. Okay. Thank you, Adrian. Thanks. Uh, all right, so now we have uh, just, I think, a very brief video about uh, a Circal uh, Avenue, which uh, I don't know if it's coming up. Yeah. So we can actually see an example of a cultural district in the Gulf. A wonderful one. Yep. Al Circle Avenue homegrown gallery spaces built the art scene. The community has been growing incredibly and we are one of the driving forces of the growth of contemporary art in the region. It's been an exciting journey to work on the Al Circle Avenue expansion project and to actually now witness all these kind of pioneer galleries adding a new dimension that this region never witnessed before. We have uh, two international art galleries, Leila Heller from New York and Stefan Costo from London. We hope to bridge the gap of the East and West between our gallery in New York and the gallery in Dubai. 
you have to have a competition between what you have here and what you have elsewhere. And when you mix together the things, everything grows up. We have John Paul Najjar Foundation. The foundation is presented in partnership with Al-Sarkal Avenue. And it's true that as a non-profit, we've been welcomed so beautifully. And Third Line, which is a major art gallery from the region. Our gallery was always just outside of Al-Sarqa. Now it, it's nice to kind of be integrated and we're already seeing the benefits of being part of a community. It's exciting seeing the curated community opening an al Avenue that shows the international interest in the regional art scene. I fall in love with the project. To mix all those people together, this is why I'm in al Sarkal because I feel happy in this community. There's a real vibe and it's very creative, it's very supportive. It was really a nice feeling of arriving into a new family. You're part of this community, part of this network that bring you sometimes some people that you're not even expecting. That's what is cool. We are partners in this and truly it's an honor to be in this amazing new development. This new international community signifies the maturity of the art scene and really opens a new chapter. This is only the beginning. It's exciting seeing a Circle Avenue evolve to the next level. Okay, thank you for that, that video and that, uh, uh, I think, sort of visualizing uh, a Circle and what they do. Uh, all right, I wanted to thank the uh, uh, presenters again for, for their talks and uh, uh, just uh, a brief summary, Metha, thank you so much for your for your presentation. I think it was uh, very interesting, very poetic. Uh, I really like the way you described uh, the magazine as a sort of little cultural space. I, I think that's that's a very interesting way to to conceptualize this and and uh, to look at it. And I also also liked your depiction of of the neighborhoods and streets in Beirut, the sort of sensory experience, which I think is something very important that sometimes get lost when we design these big cultural spaces or even the smaller ones. It becomes more corporatized and, and generic and sanitized. Uh, and I think uh, Adrian alluded to that. Um, Noura, uh, thank you for, for this really wonderful overview about uh, the cultural spaces in Bahrain and all the work that you guys are doing. I'm, I wasn't really f like aware that all of that stuff is, is, is happening there. It's, it's absolutely amazing. I'm going to have a few questions uh, about that. Uh, and Adrian, thank you for prov providing this broader overview. And uh, I have to admit, when I first started working on this, I didn't even know that uh, Cultural District Network existed. So, so that was <laughs> quite quite a revelation. <laughs> yeah, that that there's actually a network of cultural districts, and uh, people come together and discuss issues related to that. So that's very interesting. And also your discussion about the organic and the unplanned, and, and I think that raises some very interesting points. Um, just some very brief questions of uh, clarification, perhaps, for each one of you, and then I have a broader <laughs> question, uh, and then we can open it up for the audience. Uh, Metha, you, um, as, as an editor of, of uh, What That magazine, and uh, uh, given your background in architecture, design management, and, and uh, curatorial uh, uh, aspects, um, you're the sort of person, the creative person, that would be... Uh, uh, kind of uh, uh, that would fit within a cultural district, right? Like in, in a city like Dubai. Um, would you think that something like Al Quds, for example, or Asarkal Avenue would be a proper uh, venue f f for that, for having a headquarters for Watat, for example? Or would you be more comfortable in, in like design district, which is that isolated, you know, place, uh, very generic in? in uh, near uh, downtown Dubai. Like, how do you feel about that? Do you think that you find you would find a space there or a venue for your work? Um, I mean, yeah, you can sort of cultivate a space um, where, uh, wherever you choose to implant yourself in as an institution or as an organization. But for us, I think the um, industrial area of Ilgoz has very much informed um, our production process in terms of either designing or, um, or producing the publication. And that comes from the infrastructure that exists that facilitates uh, the design industry, which is uh, not only having an office, uh, but the backhand of produc uh, producing materials. And, um, and El Goz is massive in 
the sense, and it's extremely introverted, where um, in order to understand it, you have to invest a lot of time and energy in being there physically. Mm -hmm. So yes, it would be because it gives, it feeds back into uh, our work as designers uh, in trying to imp use local materials or local crafts or local uh, or locally produced. Um, you know, it goes from like aluminum to terrazzo fabrication to, and how how does that feed back into our own disciplines, right, um, right. and production process? So, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. but that takes time and and like yeah, okay. time invested in a place. So uh -huh. yes, <laughs> thank you, uh, Noura. Um, again, thank you for that uh, amazing uh, uh, overview. Um, I the Bahrain always fascinates me be because it's it's. Um, always positions itself or the way it is being presented or the kind of things you guys are doing is, is stands in in, uh, in contrast to what happen is happening elsewhere. Um, the list of spectacular museums that I presented at the beginning uh, does not include Bahrain, right? It, it, uh, even though Bahrain had one of the very first big museums, the Bahrain National Museum, which was opened in the 80s, I think. Mm -hmm. or, or yeah, uh, which is a very nice, uh, uh, beautiful museum, perhaps one of the very first ones in the Gulf mm -hmm. to, to really deal with, with culture and cultural activities. But there hasn't been anything like that since. It, it, the focus seems to be, from your presentation, on more these like smaller interventions. And I'm curious whether this is a matter, is it, it is an intentional policy, um, or is it a matter of economic realities? Like I, I'm not mm -hmm. sure. Like how? how. Uh, it's a bit of both. I mean, also we in 2014 the National Theatre opened in Bahrain. It was also one of the first theaters to open in the in the Gulf, and it's a it's a two, you know, four thousand square meter uh, performance space. I think. Um, you know, I also maybe choose to focus on these other things because I think that's where more the more challenging part of cultural contribution is. It's where, um, you know, building a theater, the theater is built next to the National Museum. It's a very interesting building. It's a cultural institution, you know, it hosts. But somehow there, the, um, you know, it's more straightforward in a sense. You build a theater, uh, you know, in a cultural uh, mm -hmm. vicinity. I think the challenge and also where there is more to invent is how to make these cultural institutions more relevant and more in touch with the local communities. And that's where a lot of our, our work is. And a lot of it has to do um, with the fact that we are very inter interested um, as part of the co government in conserving uh, these urban um these urban uh, neighborhoods from the 1930s. And we believe that this is really a legacy that's it's really crucial to, to preserve. And that's why a lot of the work that we do is directed towards that. Mm -hmm. Because before we started uh, our interventions there, these were really parts of the city that were completely neglected. There was not so much attention that was uh, brought to them. Um, and maybe I didn't emphasize this so much uh, in the presentation because I showed more the finished product and the, the projects um, in their finished state. But an even larger part of what we do has a lot to do with urban regulation, policy uh, making. For example, in Muharraq, when we started this project uh, of the purling path, the main challenge was not so much you know the architectural components of the project or even you know the squares it was really to make sure that once th you know between the time lapse when we started this project and it would be completed the urban context would not change to an extent where our project would not make sense anymore and when we started none of those regulations were in place so we had to you know work with other governmental entities to change the building code in Muharraq to make sure that the zoning would not be affected when the project would be completed um, you know to work on so now every single building permit within a buffer zone in Muharraq goes through our ministry as well so that we check on a case by case basis if what <coughs> is being built you know is according to a certain criteria so there has been uh, you know, the larger amount of these 10 years, we've been working to make sure that there is a regulation in place to preserve these uh, these mm. spaces. Yeah, that's that's really interesting because the, the danger is mm. always that once you start getting into preservation, and we see that in, in Dubai especially, that, uh, and maybe even Sharjah to some extent, that some of these 
older districts uh, turn into open air museums basically and and they are emptied out of of their inhabitants and they become a place for tourists and yeah. and we see that in uh, Bastakeya or Fahidi in in Dubai uh, uh, they have actually an, an annual art event called Sikka Art Fair which which is like uh, a very sanitized version mm -hmm. of of an of an art event so it seems to me here like through these policies and regulations that you describe that you sort of are conscious of that and you're trying mm -hmm. to find ways to mitigate it. Yeah. So that, and that's maybe yeah. one of the other things that we've been really careful about is, for example, even in some of the houses that are part of the UNESCO uh, World Heritage Site, when it was possible to make an agreement with the original owners, uh, we've done that instead of purchasing the houses themselves. And this is one of the most crucial parts, I think, in urban uh, regeneration is that the ownership stays within the mm. original owners and that the state doesn't come in and buy you know mm. whole districts mm. kind of whole piece because once that's done and there's been a lot of examples like Solidaire in Beirut or other examples it's irreversible you yeah, know there is yeah. a, a connection to the city that you lose that you can't get yeah, back yeah, again yeah yeah I mean the, the other approach will just be completely demolishing existing yeah. uh, which was what happened <laughs> in, in, in Doha yeah. uh, uh, the Meshera project <laughs> basically dismantled an existing neighborhood and replaced it with with a modern development. Um, Adrian, um, again, thank you for for your uh, presentation, um, and uh, uh, thank you for for sort of uh, uh, picking up on this notion of top down ver versus uh, bottom up, uh, and also discussing some of your work with the cultural district network. I think w an underlying issue here is is that there is this sort of paradox. Y you were talking about trying to replicate to recreate that sort of informal quality that exists in, in these art districts. And uh, that obviously is, is a very admirable objective. But once you start formalizing this or putting it in, in guidelines and planning regulations, then at the same time, you're also undermining the very qualities that uh, made these uh, spaces interesting uh, and, and attractive in the first place. So what, what are your feelings about that? I mean, is, is, is that something uh, that uh, you guys are conscious of? or? Um, who are you guys? Yeah, well, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> that could be the Cultural District Network. It's, uh, it's, okay. uh, um, all right, I'll, I'll pass on that one. Yeah. Um, so, um, well, I, I, you know, I think you can idealize, you know, the most successful districts are actually middle out, you know, rather than top down or bottom up. That is to say that the even the, you know, the sort of, paradigmatic um, bottom-up district lives in a legislative context, you know, it is subject to zoning, it is subject to, um, uh, um, you know, working within, you know, permits around districting, around licensing laws, etc. And uh, pretty soon, um, if a district is more than a sort of, you know, an, a flash over a year, then people within those districts start thinking hard about those things and start articulating what their ambitions are. You've only got to look at, um, um, uh, you know, successful uh, music scenes to see that, you know, behind every successful music scene are usually some people who are extremely vigil vigilant about what the licensing laws are, what the noise levels are, etc. So, you know, most of these things are a continuum. Mm -hmm. So that's the uh, first point I'd make. And even the most top-down um, um, uh, is uh, realizes very rapidly, you know, that either they're going to phase their project or they're going to break it up somehow because, you know, the monolithic, wh where people have created monolithic districts, they have not been as successful as they might be. Within this country, you know, Dallas um, has, gr in many ways, a great cultural district, but it is a series of large, cheek by jowl cultural institutions. And they haven't necessarily, or they only now, I say only now, the last you know, five or six years, been thinking about how do you inter animate those interstitial spaces, how do you get smaller, how do you get smaller, both cultural and uh, and um, uh, retail elements in there to give it to give it uh, space. So, 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 you know, first point I made is, is that that the reality is that that you know we have this sort of polarized dialogue between the the, the top down and the bottom up, but but the reality is that most of life you know, gravitates towards the middle, including those ostensibly bottom-up districts that have existed over a long period of time. You mm -hmm. go any, anywhere, go to Camden Town in, in London, um, believe me, it lives in a very sort of, you know, proactive legislative context. So that's the first thing I'd say. The second is we have no alternative. Um, in other words, 
These things are happening. So on what terms do you want them to happen? Uh, we did a piece of work with The Economist uh, a couple of years ago in which we looked at um, the level of investment in cultural buildings over the next 15 years. And we took away all the froth, you know, all the stuff where it's clearly never going to happen. We just looked at stuff that's coming out of the ground or where there is a fir firm government um, commitment. And we got up to about $240 billion US, okay? That's mm -hmm. the level of investment that's taking place. Do you want that investment to be, spe to, to be made mm -hmm. more or less intelligently? So, you know, the question isn't really, you know, oh, let's not do this. The question is, on what terms is it going to be done? Mm -hmm. And that's why I think that that is important. The other thing is, I think, you know, the, th the third point I'd make is, is we, we are doing this at warp speed. Um, um, uh, the, um, there is a planned cultural district, which is known Museum Island, which was planned by Schinkel in the 1840s, I think, and completed, you know, the Pergamon Museum uh, opened in 1930, so, you know, what, a 70-year period. We are now doing things like that in five years, six years, and getting impatient if it takes seven years, you know, <laughs> and saying, you know, well, what, what, you know, they're late, what's going on? I mean, so, so... Uh, so these things, uh, you know, need very, very careful strategic attention. The idea that we, you know, you can, if you're planning at that speed, you can just sort of, you know, be loosey goosey and let these things happen. It's not going to. You're going to get it wrong. So there needs to be a sort of acknowledgement, if you like, of the reality that um, um, uh, it's, you know, it, you can sort of stand back and say, oh well, um, uh, uh, these plans are sort of somehow. Um, uh, naive, naive or not, they can be more or less naive. It's uh, you know, it's a pragmatic um, uh, choice about you know how well informed and how you can. I, I think in the case of you know uh, uh, this network and all the rest of it, it's about how you can alter the climate of opinion in which those decisions are made because the decisions are often made with a very very high political imperative around um, um, accelerated economic development. Okay, yeah, thank you. Um, so uh, thank you all for your answers. I, I guess the, the last issue perhaps that I would like to raise to all of you um, is, is this notion of art washing, um, which uh, I think would be interesting in, in the context of, of Gulf, Gulf exceptionalism. And it's, it's uh, one of the interesting issues or, or one of the things that always come up is, is this, uh, 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 according to some obs observers, is Gulf exceptionality that urbanism in the Gulf is at such odds or different from the rest of the world in terms of uh, various uh, areas, various contexts, etc. Um, and when it comes to culture, the criticism is that cultural developments and cultural districts, whether they are big or small, are used as a way to hide and mask certain um, unpleasant realities uh, related to segregation, fractured urbanity, labor issues, etc. in addition to the typical term that is being associated with art washing, which is gentrification, right? So in Dubai, for example, al Quds and what's happening there becomes uh, sort of a mask for certain issues related to laborers and uh, labor accommodations. Bahrain has, has clearly uh, social and political uh, uh, issues. Uh, you were talking about public space, but we also, of course, know about the Pearl Roundabout and how that has been removed. And so is, are these cultural developments just a way to, to make things more palatable? Um, and uh, Adrian, looking at this globally, is, is this something that uh, is happening in other parts of the world as well? So I, I'm not sure. Like, so I leave that open to uh, anybody who wants to jump in and yeah, talk about this. I can start. I mean, I think uh, to speak about the context of Bahrain, um, I think at the moment we're really quite fortunate that our cultural policies are not tied into a wider economic agenda. So that's, you know, it maybe ties into the first question you asked me. I think it really gives us the freedom to do culture for culture. When we open a small music house, uh, you know, like the one we opened, it's not, um, you know, it's really serving a local community. It's meant really on a local basis to encourage and make, you know, these pearl divers have a bigger venue. It's also the reason why probably, you know, you say you never hear about these things, but it's because we're working for the local community. You know, they're not, they're not really used as a marketing strategy to position maybe Bahrain differently on a mm -hmm. worldwide state, although maybe we could benefit from it. But really, a lot of the things we do are tied to local issues related to urban generation, to improving the level um, of general, uh, you know, the level of the urban uh, streets in terms of hygiene, maintenance. And it's the reason why we also choose to insert these cultural projects within these neglected neighborhoods. 
Uh, and a lot of, in terms of, you know, programmings, exhibitions, or events, I mean, this, uh, the first project that I, uh, that I showed was really clearly trying to address uh, a social and political situation that had been, um, you know, disrupted in 2011 and that we were trying to engage with in a certain way, to open up a conversation to start speaking about wider questions related to planning, related to public space, to open up public space again. I mean, it was also um, to a certain extent quite purposeful that we decided to do it on a roundabout, to pedestrianize this roundabout, to open it to everyone, to have an, you know, an, an open voting, to have debates on that square, to encourage people to be able to speak again about um, you know, questions of who's allowed to participate in public space, what do you do in public space, and, and obviously to a certain extent, uh, you know, it's not solving all the problems, not at all, but it's trying to say and to push the frontier of what you're able to talk about and to have an open debate about these things, and I think, um, you know, we're not the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, we're not the Ministry of Interior, we're the Culture Authority, but it's our role to make sure uh, that we're able to ensure open spaces of debate within mm -hmm. the city, that mm -hmm. we're able to address certain issues that maybe sometimes, um, you know, are stigmatized or are just simply not, not spoken about. And a lot of the things we do is to try to just, you know, open up these, these topics. And I think we're, you know, we're extremely fortunate to have uh, a great minister, Sheikh Hamay al-Khalifa, who's, you know, you know, who's one of maybe the few politicians in the Arab world, I think, that's, that, that's willing and, and that's taking risks, I think, in culture, really for the sake of culture, and that has a very deep understanding uh, of what culture needs to be and what it needs to bring to society, and that really enables us to push the boundaries. Um, and we're extremely fortunate, uh, I think, as well, to be able to do this um, as part of the government in Bahrain. You know, we're not an NGO, we're not an independent culture authority, we're not, you know, we are the, the official and formal face of, uh, of culture in Bahrain. And when we say something, it has a lot of weight. And I think mm. that we're very fortunate to be able to have this freedom, um, you know, this relative freedom in Bahrain and to be able to use it. Yeah. It comes with challenges, of course, but I yeah, think that yeah. when you push the boundary from this position, you're able to push it a lot further. Yeah, uh, uh, just a brief follow up on that. I'm not sure if you're familiar with the work of Andrew Gardner, who has described Bahrain as a, a Manama, as a city of strangers. Uh, so w w when I see th th those th that roundabout project in particular and uh, the kind of people that are attracted there, because these are, I assume, they're also South Asian workers, yeah, 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 Bahraini mostly. nationals, and, and so to provide a space for that, and even without being explicitly political, you know, but mm -hmm. just to provide the opportunity is, is absolutely fascinating and I think would go a long way towards overcoming that, that stigma of, of the Gulf City as a place where people are just segregated. Mm -hmm. so, so I think that's uh, important. Um, anybody else wants to? Uh, um, yeah, I'd just like to add, like in terms of thinking about it as one term, what if we reverse the idea and sort of trying to understand the impacts of these cultural, uh, not parasites, but like interventions in the city and what they do. Like for instance, in the UAE, Sharjah and Dubai and Abu Dhabi are treating their sort of cultural production in very different scales and over a different sort of time period and duration. And the repercussions of that or the consequences vary even in one country. That using a totalizing sort of term to describe three different regions, uh, three different cities, um, uh, or like a concept could be d uh, of a disadvantage mm -hmm. because you lose the nuances in understanding what the benefits are and what the consequences yeah. are. And then the measure doesn't exist. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, 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 that's my... Okay. <laughs> so my, my two cents is, is um, Strategic investment in uh, cultural programming and cultural inf infrastructure often has a benign effect on adjacent property values. That is to say, the value of the surrounding property goes up. That is generally regarded as a good thing. And indeed, it is the rationale, it's known as economic impact, it's the rationale that is often created uh, for um, investment in the arts. You're in a very privileged position. You're in a, uh, uh, from your description, in which you have a benign authority that's interested in the development of culture for culture's sake. Um, um, most, most 
people looking to shake the money tree have to create very elaborate arguments around economic impact. Um, uh, and one of the impacts is values go up. What that also means is that if you own that land, hooray. If you're a rental in that land, mm. boo. Why? Because you get displaced, because you can no longer afford to pay those rents. Yeah. So that is the cost of development, not cultural washing, you know, all, all development. So then the question is, presumably, if you want to protect the character, either the artistic character or the social character of that area, you need to plan. Mm -hmm. That is to say that the public sector, not the developer, the public sector needs to assert its interest in the public domain and it needs to say, or it needs through zoning, through all its all the you know instruments of public policy, we want to ensure that the the benefits of this gain in property values do not go uniquely to the uh, owner. They are spread. How might you spread them? Social housing. Um, how might you spread them? Uh, um, um, uh, artists live workspaces. Um, uh, um, uh, community trusts in which um, uh, land is uh, lodged so that as values go up, the community benefits from it as well. That requires, you can't do that retrospectively. You can't, you know, wait until it's success and say, oh dear, you know, um, what are we going to do? Let's go, because you can no longer <laughs> afford to intervene. Mm -hmm. So the time to do that is right at the, right at the um, uh, pre uh, pre-investment, and that requires planning, and it requires foresight. But um, uh, and uh, even the even the best, uh, you know, in the case of a roaring property market, you know, it's extremely difficult to um, uh, to ensure uh, total equity, um, uh, and you're unlikely ever to achieve it. But you can achieve a degree of equity through planning and through assertion of the public domain, because where there is development pressure, there is the opportunity for a strong and determined public sector to accrue public benefit. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, thanks, Adrian, for that. Uh, we still have some time left for maybe a few questions. So, if anybody has, uh, all right. So uh, we have here and here, and so we can start with you. Thank you, everyone. It's a pleasure um, not to be in my um, home cubicle <laughs> working. <laughs> thanks for Alcercal for inviting me to be part of this symposium. Um, very fascinating, um, wonderful insights that have been shared. Um, what, as, as a curator, what I'm interested in kind of um, discussing, uh, a, you know, is actually the program, regardless of whether there was um, the wonderful, um, you know, uh, very unique opportunity as in Bahrain, where this authority happens to have this very particular leader um, that has a vision and is willing to um, flow um, with that vision and, and hire those who will also do what's right. We mm -hmm. don't actually have that scenario in most cases. Um, we also don't have the scenario um, where um, uh, the bigger institutions, the developments, the museums, um, they're going to sort of get over that, that whole egoistic you know, approach of uh, building massive spaces to insert um, ego, power, um, you know, whatnot. Um, and we don't have, you know, uh, something maybe what we can say is programmatic is what um, Meta is doing because she's sort of in between all of these spaces and places, and um, she, she's managing to, uh, you know, use the aesthetics of language and, and visual arts and combine the two into, a, 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 to give a form of expression and, and create this space um, for a program that communicates what's going on um, and gives access, right? So the question that I have for you, um, Nora, which uh, you know I, I love the proactivity and you know the insight that goes into the whole process of thinking about what happens, uh, or even the fact that there was so much consciousness that you didn't build all of the squares at once. You gave time to see how the the audience interacted, um, and then sort of took step, but. The question I have for you, and, and you know, it, it's also anyone who wants to answer it, is what happens to when um, 
no matter how much things you've taken into consideration, time is a factor of reality and um, there are so many other forces that we just cannot envision and control. Um, and uh, when, when that functionality or that vision expires. Um, I'm curious about, um, let's say, um, what happens to that, th this um, uh, garden that, mm -hmm. that you've created in the middle of the city um, is, is, is like, because the program is also really important. Mm. What happens in these spaces organically over time and who gets to uh, actually have a chance to um, deal with it? Because yeah. the fact is whether it's beautiful or ugly or whatever, it's there. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, and the fact is that uh, you know there's a massive population of artists and creators uh, that need spaces to work with. So um, I guess uh, how would how does the authority also leave room for um, that organic process where you know the the program is not controlled mm -hmm. in a sense that there's there's also the an, it becomes an incubator also for other organizations and the community to uh, use the space. Uh, in the way that it needs to. Mm -hmm. um, but are you talking about a specific project now? The yeah, in general. In like general. In all these projects that you have on, maybe let's say like the, the people waiting for a program to happen in this garden, and it's interesting mm. that that was happening. Um, so like, w would there be an, a willingness by the authority to allow that to happen if, if there was a program, let's say a curator came along and said, I yeah. want to do a show. I mean, yeah, thanks for the question. It's obviously, it's, you know, it's it's difficult building things and then it's even more difficult once you open them, no? Because exactly. all the questions arise, for sure. Um, I mean, there were, there's two different kinds of projects we work on. The first, y the square and the, and the squares, they're public spaces. So initially the idea is that a public space should function on its own, no? You shouldn't need to program it. But obviously when you insert them in cities where the habit of public space has been lost and we've unlearned so many of the things that were naturally present, people don't know what to do in public space anymore. You know, they come and, and in our part of the world, and, and this is also something quite general, like public space has become so linked with entertainment that when you remove the entertainment factor, you know, people are kind of lost and they don't understand the utility of it. When we first started planning these public spaces, we did a kind of small survey in the community and we asked them mm -hmm. what they wanted and everyone just wanted more parking spaces because <laughs> I, that's what they needed. I, I can also understand, I mean, it's hot and they live in these. Uh, so, and then we asked them, okay, but how many? And they needed like 12 per household. So we thought, okay, I mean, this is not going anywhere. And we just, I mean, we did build parking spaces, but elsewhere. And then we built these squares, uh, and then we went back to them after a month, and we asked them, you know, what? And then they had really precise um, feedback that the openings around the tree were so big, and now the children were not able to bike as well as they used to. I mean, they were not able to bike at all before. But somehow, you know, sometimes you need to lead the way in what is possible to do. And once these squares were built and they were there, the people that were living there started understanding the possibilities, again, of what they could do, what their children could do, what a tree could provide as shade, as... But it was, it was really difficult. I mean, the first, we replanted the trees on these squares four times because there was so much vandalism from the children present there. And, you know, we had to create... Um, we had we had designated a special person who was responsible for you know community awareness and activities. She organized you know events for children on the square to explain the project to them. To and then you know we got she kind of got to know the community really well and she asked them. Uh, it was quite complicated why they removed the trees and then it, at the end it reached someone told her, yeah, but the trees don't belong to anyone. <laughs> so why are you angry that we removed them? But you know, you also, you start working in a complete um, vacuum. For so long, the public sphere wasn't present. So you can't come do one square and, and expect that, you know, everyone's going to yeah. cheer for you. You know, you need to, people need to learn again things that unfortunately haven't been present uh, in the city. And it was, it's, it's been a long uh, learning curve. For the, the pavilion, I mean, it's an open space. So we're always, um, we're always you know, available. People contact us a lot to host events. Or, and then we decide um, accordingly. Uh, we have you know, a, f a few venues in Bahrain, like m museums with really nice outside spaces. But 
Here, you know, again, it's the same thing. This understanding of what public spaces are and what public good is isn't present. So most of the requests we get are because people want to get married in the museum or they want to host their son's birthday in the expo. Or, yeah. And, you know, we need to explain, you know, but this is a public space. We can't close it for your birthday, you know. You, you know, if you're having an event and, and yeah. you know, it's, but we need to explain this all the time. Or someone comes and they want to do a fundraiser for you know, a private initiative or something. So we ask, you know, is it an NGO? Is it open to everyone? And then it's like, no, they want to teach people how to invest in stocks or something. So we said, but that's not really, you know, of the public good. So, you know, this definition of what public is, what you can host in a public space, you know, what's open to all, what's, they're all notions that are, um, that are not present in a sense and that we also need to redefine, you know, and we're also open to understanding once again, you know, what is actually what is public and what should we have there. But it's a challenge for sure and it's probably the, the, more, the most difficult part. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you. As a gentleman in the back, yeah. Thank you very much. Alexander Kravitz from Insight Iraq. Thank you to the panelists for some very engaging presentations and to the moderator for your thought-provoking questions, I have to say. I'm, I, I know we're talking about the Gulf, but I'm wondering if I could just maybe shift slightly the geographic focus. To the north, there's Iraq that's going to require, you know, huge amounts of, for reconstruction. I mean, like, practically whole cities. And I'm wondering if some of your experiences in your organizations, you know, could be, I mean, I think they could obviously be applied, but have you considered, um, you know, sort of sharing your experiences and maybe even, you know, providing sort of ad advisory help and whatnot, uh, or is it maybe too premature? Or if you have thought about it, how that, that could happen, that's uh, sort of addressed to, to, to the panel at large. And then more specifically, the second question for Nura, I'm just very curious. I was reading your bio, and I was wondering if you could share with us the work that you did in Jerusalem. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay, thank you. I, I can answer the first, second question, which ties into the first. I worked in Jerusalem in 2004 with a program called the Old City of Jerusalem Revitalization Project that's part of the welfare institution. So it's an NGO, one of the, one of the few and only, I think, NGOs that is completely funded by um, Palestinian individuals that works in development projects in Jerusalem in the West Bank. So I worked there uh, in a year in conservation. Uh, which was actually really interested because it related very much with the work I started doing in Bahrain, which also had to do with preservation and conservation. And although the context was d completely different, the challenges with the community are quite similar when you work in, in these kind of um, districts. Um, and I was working there with Dr. Shadia Tuqan, who is a, a great urban conservation specialist, and she now works in Bahrain. She heads the UNESCO uh, Regional Center, a Category 2 center. Um, and they're actually, I think a lot of this funding that came for Iraq was initiated through the UNESCO. Um, and so they're working closely with the regional center, which is, uh, has its headquarters in Bahrain, and that serves the whole Middle East uh, region. So they have... Um, they have four or five experts that are based in Bahrain and whose role is to work with other entities and governmental institutions across the Arab world uh, in conservation and more specifically in uh, World Heritage uh, nominations. So I think a, a lot of the work, uh, large parts of it are also financed by the UAE. I think the reconstruction, for example, of the Al Nuri Mosque, which is going to be financed by the UAE, under the auspices of the UNESCO, will also be coordinated through the regional center, which provides expertise in conservation. If and in so far as there is transferable knowledge generated by GCDN, it, we codify it and stick it on the website and publish it. And I'm quite sure that the members would, you know, be flattered to be, you know, ask their views in some charrette-like form on things. I'm also very aware that, you know, context is critically important, and that, you know, having worked enough in an international context, I know that, you know, um, you know, extreme sensitivity to. Uh, to local conditions is a sort of axiomatic in these, in these issues. But um, yeah. Okay. Thank you. Okay, 
Yeah. Sort of Katie, yeah, yeah. Let me try this out. So I think it was you, Adrian, who said, well, first of all, thank you, everybody. Wonderful panel. Thank you, Yasser. And it's wonderful in order to hear more about Bahrain. We don't get to hear very often about Bahrain in Washington. And I think, Adrian, you said that the region has been investing in these sort of spectacular cultural spaces. We've seen this top-down investment when the global trend uh, is to move more toward these organic, bottom-up cultural spaces. Um, and, you know, I'm wondering, in, in the Gulf now, we have the, the, you know, the wonderful museums, but I'm sure Maitha and Noura, we'd like to see more of these organic cultural initiatives that are more inclusive, that perhaps reflect more the demand side rather than the, the supply side. And I'm just wondering, what are the next steps, you know, that need to be taken? What are the ingredients we need to see more of in the UAE, um, you know, in Saudi? I mean, it sounds like Bahrain is sort of doing it to, to get there, to allow for these more organic cultural initiatives to emerge that are, you know, led by individuals as opposed to the state. Can I, can I answer very briefly? Uh, it's because um, You misrepresented me. Um, um, uh, I, I think, well, first of all, I think the UAE is extremely interesting because the UAE is not a, a, a single model by any, you know, what's happening in Sharjah mm. is very different from what's happening in Dubai and is very uh, different from what's happening in Abu Dhabi. In fact, I'm just looking right now, it's not in the pack, but Hanan has done a monograph on uh, development of the visual arts in, um, uh, in the UAE, and it shows the sheer plurality of uh, activity, some of which is associated with large capital projects, much of which isn't. And, and it gives a sort of texture that belies the idea that this is the land of, you know, just the land of top down. Uh, it's not at all. And I think that's a sort of, fund it's, it's a fundamental, you know, misconception and one understands the optics. It's the same reason that, you know, we don't read about Bahrain all the time because there is a sort of, um, you know, there is a compelling, you know, uh, uh, interest, and we all have it, you know, in in large edifices. You know, it's known as the edifice complex, and um, um, and uh, you know, uh, what did all my GCDN guys want to do when they came to Dubai? They wanted to get on a bus and go to the Louvre uh, as quickly as possible, and you know, um, uh, me too. You know, so so uh, you know, there is a place for all these things. Um, and I don't think it's, uh, and I don't think that in any way uh, the UAE or indeed the Gulf more generally is sort of behind the curve on this. It's right in the middle of this preoccupation of the balance between, you know, highly expressive iconic architecture. And don't forget, you know, part of the thrill of this architecture is we can do it. It's only relatively recently that we can do it. It's advances in CAD, it's advances in, in um, structural engineering, and it's in advances in material science that means that if you draw the Burj on a napkin, you can actually go out and build it now, whereas you couldn't before, and therefore we're we're still globally, you know, having this cheap thrill, if you like, of being able to build pretty well any shape that we, you know, conjure up. And here is a canvas in which to do it, or here is a context in which to do it. And cultural architecture is the best place to do it because you've just got these big voids that you can sort of, you know, pull around. So, you know, cultural, you know, cultural buildings have become the playground, really, for us to experiment, not just architects, but structural engineers and clients in, you know, in how to make this highly expressive stuff. And we're still, we're sort of working that out. Of, we're sort of maturing. We're working it out of our system. In fact, was it the Chinese president who made an announcement recently that he didn't want to see any more silly architecture? Um, yeah. What he meant by that was this highly, you know, highly expressive, you know, engineered architecture. So, so that's one point. The other point is is that I think, but I do think that there is a sort of crisis coming, um, in uh, and the crisis is the mismatch between the way artists are working and the way audi audiences are, are, are you know want to experience things highly informal, experiential, and um, our our sort of you know what we as a professional, what, you know, archi uh, architects, designers, theater consultants, museum designers are generating, which, are, which are remain spaces that have a certain sort of monumentality, which is often at odds with, with the experiences that people want. And I think that that's going to take a while to, 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 you know, work its way through the system. Frank Lloyd Wright once said that doctors can bury their mistakes. Unfortunately, architects can't bury their mistakes. <laughs> and, that, you know, we live, with, we live with this stuff for a long time. So I think there will be a period when we will look around and we say, oh, gosh, yeah, that was a sort of 2000, 2018, wasn't it? Yeah, you, you know, it, it's big and it sort of doesn't move much. And then nothing happens to it. No. So can you see more highly informal and experiential? 
But I, I, I think, you know, cultural diversity, like uh, Adrian said, is also really important. I mean, in Bahrain, we develop these kind of things because our urban context is different. Budgets are also different. But all these spaces in the region are really important. Like for us, an institution like the Louvre, that you could take a plane in half an hour and have something like that is an incredible change for the region and a really positive one. You know, the fact that school children that are in Bahrain half an hour away have access to this is, you know, is tremendously positive. And, you know, there's, you know, culture is diverse and all these spaces need to exist side by side, you know, and I think it would be a bit reductive to say that we need to only emphasize on the organic side, you know, of culture. It's important, of course, and it nurtures maybe a different kind of cultural production. But big institutions, you know, like you have here in DC, like the Smithsonian, like, are, you know, are just as, are just as important. And we need to make sure that we don't, um, you know, have a discourse that maybe privileges yeah. one side over the other. Mm -hmm. But I think we need to understand how all these cultural components can work together to create a context where, um, you know, we encourage education, we encourage knowledge, we encourage, uh, you know, an open understanding of what culture is. Mm. Yeah, no, and I that? think, yeah, what's a, what's, uh, what the UAE has that's beneficial is site and location where through the programming of spaces like Sirkal or larger institutions like uh, the museums in Sharjah, they draw in informal collectives or, or other sort of um, groups that are from around the region, be it in Kuwait or uh, in the Gulf or from Cairo and Beirut and um, like Ashkal Elwan and uh, Townhouse in Cairo. And the UAE, the UAE becomes a point in which the discourse happens, um, either through programming or and within these larger institutions. So they go hand in hand and feed, uh, feed each other, which is essential, I think. Mm. Um, yeah, I, I think that's really a very interesting point, and I think it's it's a good point to sort of uh, finish on. Uh, uh, I think the discussion at, at, uh, in the beginning was sort of positioned that uh, spectacular architecture, architects are like the bad guys in, in, in this story here. And uh, it, it really uh, it depends. It's uh, architecture can play a very positive role. Spectacular architecture can really regenerate, revitalize, and uh, I'm just thinking about Centre Pompidou in Paris, which, which was really the ultimate of, of an iconic a project that has become part of the neighborhood, has become a public mm -hmm. space, has attracted people, and it really shows um, the positive qualities when uh, architecture is designed well and is takes into consideration uh, various uh, contextual issues. I really wish we had more time for questions, but I think we need to mm -hmm. stop here, so I just want to thank our thank panelists you. again. Thank you. Thank you very much.